what we're talking about today is about uh, an interesting uh, anniversary and an interesting concept. There's things I'm going to tell you about that are informative and illustrative, I think, about how uh, a small group of people under the right supervision with the right motivation can change the world. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the so-called Bergen School of Meteorology, uh, led by uh, Dr. Wilhelm Björknes, and also talk about the 100th anniversary of the so-called Norwegian cyclone model, which may not ring a bell, but you'll see something. I guarantee everybody in this room will see something in just a minute that will look familiar to you that human eyes never got a chance to see until something, oh, just a little bit shy of 60 years ago when we were able to see it from space. Think about, as we go through this today, trying to figure out what the weather's doing without having the ability that we have today, on our phone even, to see what satellite imagery shows from above. Trying to figure out what something's doing when you're in it is quite a challenge. So without further ado, let's go ahead and move to the first slide. So what a difference this entry makes. Yeah, it can make a big difference. Now this is a picture from space. It shows over a period of days, as you can see, the movement of the atmosphere. If you look, you can see patterns that are familiar. And we've all seen this. Usually what we see is a zoomed in part of this. So the satellites that generate most of the images that you see on television or on the computer are out there about 22,300 miles way out, geosynchronous orbit, and they zoom in to get a view of the area that's of interest to us. So we recognize those patterns. We've seen them. We watch them on the news. We watch these storms progress from west to east across our country. And, and we see these waves in the atmosphere. You can see them in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And many people, maybe even most people in this room, have some idea of how this works. But keep in mind, that's because people before you, and not really that long ago, figured this out and made this possible for us to understand how it works. In hindsight, everything's 2020. You know, Mark Twain once said, the ancients have stolen all my best ideas. I, I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But sometimes you think, wow, a new product comes in. Why didn't I think of that? I don't know. Why didn't you? <laughs> the trick is going to be to think of the next one of those things, right? So some of the things that we're going to see uh, in hindsight or from the perspective that we have now uh, with satellites are, are obvious. I think that if we'd have had a satellite image like this, any number of people could have figured out some of the things that we're going to talk about. But keep in mind that the things that happened a century or so ago and a little before that occurred without the benefit of these satellite uh, images. But we're going to actually go back even further. We're going to go back about 300 years, really. Well, not quite, but a little bit more than the century. We're going to go back to Ben Franklin. I don't know how many of you have spent much time reading about Ben Franklin. Uh, there's myth and then there's reality and then there's something in between. Uh, he's been, you know, uh, through our patriotic mythology elevated to this high position uh, in our esteem. But if you take a look at the facts behind Ben Franklin's life and accomplishments, you realize this guy was really something. I mean, I would have loved to have had an opportunity to sit down with him and have probably more than a couple tankards because he had a lust for living. But he was a brilliant man and he was a polymath. He did things in all manner of different disciplines. And I think a big part of it is illustrated by this very anecdote. Chance favors the prepared mind. Maybe you've heard that. And many people that make discoveries, great and small, they make them because their eyes are open and their mind is open. And they say, whoa, wait a minute. That's kind of weird. I wonder what's making that happen. And then they don't just leave it at that. They go about finding out why that happens or what's going on. So Franklin was interested in observing uh, an eclipse of the moon. Um, a storm was moving in to Philadelphia, a nor'easter, okay, with the winds coming from the direction that they're named for, right? So he logically assumed that since Boston was to the northeast of him, that his correspondence, 
in Boston were similarly shut out from the eclipse. But then he finds out, in fact, they had a good view of it. How could it be that the weather that was coming from the Northeast hadn't obscured Boston's view? And so this really was something that he was curious about. And he went about investigating it. And he did so because remember that one of the other jobs that he ultimately held was postmaster, first postmaster general. But he was a, a, a very prolific correspondent with many people that he, he uh, knew and, and had met. And so he started to get information from people and asked them if they would keep a, a, a record of the weather. And many farmers did this as a matter of course anyway. And they would send him the information. And over a period of time, he started to figure out there were some patterns going on. And it's, the storms were not coming from the direction that the wind was coming from. In fact, often they were coming from the opposite direction. Nor'easters are approaching from the southwest. So this was an interesting discovery that Franklin makes. Franklin actually works this out and in, in one of his writings describes, and it's in rudimentary terms, but he describes one of the first um, schemes of how high and low pressure systems work and how storm movement works in, in our hemisphere. And it's counterintuitive. It's not just descriptive, he's understanding things that are counterintuitive. The first organization that was dedicated to collecting weather data, quite uh, you know, logically, turns out to be the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, which still exists today. If you go to Philadelphia, they've got a great museum to visit there. In 1831, the Franklin Institute started a, a regular uh, program of collecting and mapping weather data. But here's the problem. They don't have instantaneous communication quite yet. So they have to wait for all the information to come in, sometimes weeks and even a, a month or more later. And then they take all this information and, and, and correlate it by, by date and time and draw their maps and, and charts. So they're seeing a weather map of past weather. And that's no good if you're trying to tell somebody what the weather is doing today or even trying to make a forecast for tomorrow. But it is a good thing if you're trying to look at patterns and put together over time uh, a sequence of events to figure out what's going on. So that was actually very valuable to look at this past data to be able to try to put together some understanding of what the patterns were doing. And based on those patterns and based on those uh, cycles to try to understand things well enough to use that to make some predictive uh, uh, prognostications about the weather that's going on now. For instance, we understand now that there's a regular pattern to the way the winds clock around in direction. So when they're coming hard out of the southwest, what's going to happen pretty soon after that? Here in Tampa, they're coming out of the southwest hard and muggy and hot even in January. What do we know from experience follows that? A hard 90 degree wind shift and winds from the northwest that are cold. Now, we can know that by observation without understanding conceptually what's making it happen. And that's kind of where they were at that time. By observation and looking at these patterns, they were coming up with predictive capabilities that were, that were rooted in, in looking at patterns and, and, and knowing that these kinds of cycles work the way they did. To move forward, what would be very beneficial would be able to, to be able to see the atmosphere at a given moment in time fairly close to real time. And that capability comes as a result of the telegraph. And so when the telegraph is invented, soon after it's put to use in sending information about the weather. Joseph Henry was at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington and he convinced his bosses at the Smithsonian to purchase telegraph uh, uh, companies' weather instruments, and they were rudimentary, and to have those weather instruments distributed out to key locations and have those telegraph operators, when they weren't busy with their primary job, 
send in messages about what's going on. Especially if they could coordinate the collection of the data at a certain point in time. So that everybody at a certain time, or fairly close to it, would make observations, send those in. And this is how, for the first time ever, we were able to get a weather map that had near real-time data captured on it. You combine that with an understanding of patterns and you're starting to get the develop, to develop the, the, the ability to make rudimentary predictions. Something more than just how much fur is on a woolly worm or you know, red sky in morning, sailor take warning kinds of things. To understand weather well enough that you can start to make some uh, predictions that have some basis in, in what we would call today a scientific uh, basis. So telegraphic reporting made synoptic what today we refer to as a synoptic chart possible. And the telegraph network was pretty rudimentary, but it grew pretty fast. And so by 1860, there were 500 stations across the United States that were furnishing daily information. By 1870, information came in all the way from the West Coast. One of the things people often uh, forget is that when the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, simultaneous with the completion of the railroad was the completion of the Transcontinental Telegraph Network. And by the way, if anybody's into communication or broadcast journalism, that was the first national, nationally uh, a reported event in real time. Telegraph stations across the entire country went silent to get the report from Promontory Point when that happened. So by the time that the 1870s are around, we have a telegraph network across the country that's able to report in weather information. They're collecting it uh, as reasonably as possible in a coordinated manner in time. And now this data starts to give the United States the ability to have some of the best uh, weather data in the, in the world. Now keep in mind that by today's standards, it's really pretty rudimentary. But by the, at, in that time, it was really something. Now often you hear this term, the American storm. And you keep seeing this. You're going to see this in several more slides. The American storm. Well, there's the American storm. And the American storm, we know today by several names. Anybody want to shout it out? What's that? Cyclone. Yeah, it's a cyclone. Mid-latitude cyclone, wave cyclone. <coughs> But in those days, one of the things that was known colloquially as was the American storm. It was kind of understood that we had these storms. They came across the Midwest. Some of them swung down out through the Great Lakes region. They whipped up through New England and, and, and out to sea. Once we understood how the nor'easter really wasn't coming from the northeast, we had a, a better idea of what these were uh, doing. They called these the American storm. Now, there's a European storm that's like this, but uh, for whatever reason, it was not uh, uh, as uh, closely studied, at least at that time. Now, oftentimes it's tragedies that make things happen, or I should say more specifically, it's things that cost somebody a lot of money that makes things happen. Uh, and in uh, 1869, something happened that cost a lot of money. They had a, a really, really uh, a bad year for storms on the uh, Great Lakes and in the upper Midwest. And in that year, there was a tremendous amount of shipping losses on the Great Lakes. And in fact, uh, something in the neighborhood of about a third of the vessels that regularly plied the Great Lakes were either damaged or destroyed uh, in that year. So could you imagine, you know, something in the neighborhood of a third of our, of our, sh of our you know, fleet today, commercial ships, uh, being damaged or destroyed. This got the attention of Congress. Congress passed a joint resolution and the language is to provide for taking meteorological observations at the military stations in the interior of the continent and at other points in the states and territories and for giving notice on the northern lakes and on the seacoast by magnetic telegraph and marine signals, semaphores or whatever of the approach and force of the storms. This was the task that was given to the Army Signal Corps. Uh, over the years that task was handed off, uh, 
and ultimately this this uh, mandate is what gives rise to the National Weather Service under the uh, aegis of uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of today. So the direct um, act that began what today we have as the National Weather Service uh, was a proclamation signed by President Ulysses S. Grant and it was driven by these winter storms in particular, although they had some bad ones in the summer, uh, damaging ships. Now, around the same time as those things were happening, this fellow was born on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. <coughs> this is Wilhelm Bjerknes. He was born in 1862 in Norway. And there is a tendency we sometimes have to pull people out and, and have a singular sort of uh, individual that is put on a pedestal when in fact there's often many other people that either did the same thing at the same time or were involved or whatever. Um, we're going to see there were other people certainly in this story as it unfolds but I, I really submit to you that his influence earns him the right for some uh, very significant praise as an individual for what he accomplished and also what he was able to empower others under his tutelage to, to accomplish. So uh, Bjergnes was uh, interested in, in physics and interested in things that at first you think, well, how does this guy end up being so uh, influential in meteorology? Well, the transition from descriptive meteorology to uh, theoretical and computational and numerical weather prediction uh, involves physics. <coughs> and it involves looking at the atmosphere and understanding how it works, not just describing what you're seeing, but understanding how things work so that you can model it and predict it and, and be able to understand it. He starts out in his uh, professional career working with none other than Heinrich Hertz. Now, let me, I'll give you this clue. This isn't the rental car guy, okay? <laughs> Where else have we heard Hertz before? Ryan's already answered, so he's disqualified. <laughs> Hertz. Kilohertz, megahertz. Somebody said sound. Yeah, you can hear waves at a certain range of frequency. You can pick them up, electromagnetic waves and other uh, at other frequencies. So Heinrich Hertz uh, is one of the pioneers of studying electromagnetic radiation and things of that sort and Birkney studies under him uh, in Sweden. He ultimately takes a position uh, in physics in Sweden at the University of Stockholm, moves to the University in Oslo, Norway, and then goes to uh, leave to Germany to be a professor of geophysics. So he's progressing in his career and he's there in Germany in 1912 on the eve of something that's about to occur. It's going to change the world in many ways, change his world and change many other things. In 1917 he founds, he's the founder of the Geophysical Institute at the University of Bergen. And when we talk about the Bergen School, it, it wasn't a school like, it, it was a school of thought. It operated out of the University of Bergen. It was a, a department, you might call it, right? It was a group of people, an institute within a, a school, for instance. Here, if you're a student here, you know, we have the Honors Institute that operates here. So how he gets there, we'll come back to in just a little bit. But there he is, uh, Dr. Wilhelm Björknes. The pioneer of numerical forecasting. And w when you take a look to see what the breakthrough was that really moved him into the realm of meteorology, it was when he developed a theorem and, and then uh, added to that work uh, of hydrodynamic uh, theorem that dealt with the motion of a vortex in a non-homogeneous fluid. Understanding how circulation patterns 
in a non-homogeneous fluid work is the key to understanding oceanic circulation. And it's no coincidence that he worked alongside oceanographers early in his career and later in his career as well, and also the atmosphere. And of course, the two uh, work together to influence our, our climate and our, our world. When he understood that there were equations that seemed to offer the ability to understand what's going on in the motion of the atmosphere, or for that matter, the, the ocean, he, he realized that it would be possible, and in red is his goal, the goal is to predict the dynamic and physical condition of the atmosphere at a later time, if at an earlier given time this condition is well known. That requires a couple of things. You got to know what the condition is presently. And as we just discussed, that capability is now at hand or uh, is emerging. Uh, and then if you know what the rules are, and this is what he's also working on, then you should be able to say, if it's doing this now, and I know that this is the rules by which it operates, it then should be doing this later, and then you can make a prediction. The problem is getting from now to later, even if you know the rules, requires something that just didn't exist in his time period. What do you think that might be? Take a guess. What's that? I can't hear it clearly. <laughs> Satellites will come later. We're really talking now about another piece of technology. So you're in the right ballpark. It's right in front of you. The answer is right in front of you. Look right in front of you. <laughs> no, because you could look it up. Okay, oh, oh I can predict the weather because I went to the NOAA site. No, right in front of you. What is that thing? It's a computer. You know how it got its name? It got its name from the women it put out of work. Without going too far down a rabbit hole, astronomers had some of the same problem, crunching numbers. They were collecting data from spectroscopy in the early 20th century faster they can process it. So they hired a bunch of women using a model that worked real well in the textile mills of New England. And that's where if you're a farmer and you've got a bunch of sons, that's your labor. If you're a farmer and you've got a bunch of daughters, that is your liability. Why? you got to pay another farmer or his sons to take them off your hand. The whole idea of a dowry? So what do you do? Well, this great idea comes. Textile mill operators would bring these women to the textile mills. They would have a very strict marm that would stay there and whip, crack the whip and ensure and maintain their virtue while they earned money to put aside for their own dowries. A great system, huh? Maybe, I don't know. <coughs> Astronomers at, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at Harvard, they said, whoa, wait a minute, that's not a bad idea. Let's get some of them that we can teach to use slide rules and log tables, and we'll put them around big tables, and we'll have, instead of a mill making doilies or bolt cloth, they'll crunch numbers. And that's what they did. And so everybody has to have a time card to get paid, right? Or to get their dowry accumulated so it goes back to the farm. So what's your job? Well, you, you know, you're a professor. That's what's on your time card or a dean or whatever. Um, their job was computer because they computed stuff. So when electronic computers were developed around the time of World War II, ENIAC and Colossus and those things, after the war, those were put to use on things like cracking weather calculations, calculating ballistics trajectory tables, figuring out election results. Well, the people that put out of work were computers. So they called the machine a computer. So it got its name from people. It's true, true story. Computers have made a tremendous amount of progress in your lifetime, even if you're among the youngest in here. My 17-year-old was making this noise the other day about how bad my computer was when it's only four years old. He goes, oh, that's a piece of junk, Dad. I said, well, when you start buying it with your own money, then the refresh rate changes, right? 
But real, realistically, computers have made a lot of progress. And if you know the rules by which the atmosphere plays and you've got the data, then the big problem is being able to compute it fast enough that the forecast is really a forecast and not a hindcast. And as late as, really, 30 years ago, there were still a lot of forecasts that were hindcast, but they still did them because they expected, thanks to Moore's law, that the technology would catch up. And if they understood the algorithm, then when the computing power caught up, then the forecast would be a forecast. Again, in, in the lifetime of the younger of you in here, you've always had a reasonably reliable three to five day and, and later a five to seven day forecast. When I say reasonably reliable, it's better than a roll of the dice. We always remember when it doesn't work out and we fail to give credit when it does. And now the 10 day forecast is reasonably powerful in many places and that's a direct result of the computers getting faster, getting, getting better. It can let us take those numerical calculation boxes and make them smaller. Birkney's knew how to do the weather forecasting we do today. He wrote about how it could be done, how to grid up the atmosphere two-dimensionally at the surface, then take it into three dimensions, make a series of calculations for every box, how every box interacted with all the boxes around it, and he knew it was a complete fool's errand to try to do it with slide rules and to try to do it with any kind of calculation that they had in that time. When electronic computers came into existence, he knew this would happen. He lived, as you saw, to 1951. He saw the electronic computers coming into existence that he knew would someday allow us to do what we do today. In 1905, he came to America and gave a lecture at MIT. And what he was introducing was an idea that he originated, and that's the idea of air masses. Now that's an idea that you all are familiar with. We talk about a cold air mass is coming down out of Canada or a maritime tropical air mass is working its way up over the southeast. We talk about that today. He originates the idea of large masses of air that across a great distance within them have the same characteristics more or less of temperature and humidity. And then other ones nearby perhaps that have different characteristics but within their boundaries are somewhat uniform. This idea of air masses also ties into circulation. Again, using physics, he understands how these air masses might be put into motion by gravitational forces and the spin of the Earth. He impressed the people at MIT, but most importantly, he impressed people from Carnegie Institution, and he got an award of a research associateship with a grant that continued until 1941. And I can tell you what, those of you in the audience that are academics know, man, that's like the, what's on the National Lampoon's thing, the Jelly of the Month Club, that's the gift that keeps on giving, Clark. Because you're getting that money, and that helped fund his research for years and years. So there's an interesting connection through this story about how these Norwegian meteorologists have a, have a distinct connection back to the United States. World War I comes along and it has a great impact on any number of things. Björknitz was at Leipzig when the war broke out and many of his students and staff were, were called up. One of his most promising graduate students, uh, Herbert Petzold, was killed at Verdun. Um, he wasn't the only one of the students of uh, Virknes who was killed, but his uh, death plays a role in the story because the work he was doing was showing uh, some promise. And Virknes' Bir own son, Jacob, known as Jack, uh, took up the work and, and continued uh, the work that uh, Petzold had started. And that work had to do with combining his father's air mass idea with something that was emerging from their uh, observations of surface weather. And that's these boundary areas between air masses and the patterns of weather that occur along those boundaries, these convergence lines. Where are those guys there? Uh, what, what are they doing in that picture from World War I? That's, a real, that's not from that movie. That's a real colorized picture from the war. <laughs> the, what's that? Reading a map. Yeah, but where are they? 
They're in a trench, yeah. That, that war was fought along long battle lines between the opposing armies that stretched for hundreds uh, and hundreds of miles, and the battle lines would move uh, back and forth a bit. So the battle lines between armies of the air, when things are going on in your time, it often bleeds over into your thinking and it bleeds over into your terminology. And so Jack Bjergne is, is thinking about how these big air masses are battling against each other and the, the, the action is all taking place at the boundary. Nothing's going on very far back in the air mass. It's all happening at the boundary and the boundary between air masses he uh, analogizes to the boundary between armies and he uses the terms that are used in, in the military terminology of the time. He starts to call these fronts. And so here's one of the maps from that time, the idea of these fronts being the places where the air is converging. What he had called previously convergence uh, lines start being called fronts. This is a map that shows uh, the, the battle fronts from World War I, the Central Powers and the Allies, and you can see that the armies battle back and forth and these, these battle lines move. And this, this is a, 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 a map that he's looking at where these air masses are fighting it out. This becomes frontal weather theory. Now, we're going to come back to that in a bit, but you might notice that we're now sort of changing our venue because now leaving Leipzig because of the war, Wilhelm Birkenes, the father, has taken his son and his researchers, a cadre of them, and on an invitation from the famous uh, scientist uh, Fridtjof Nansen, who you may know of because of his polar explorations with the, the ship called the Fram. He's the first man to cross Greenland on skis and pushed as far north as anybody had ever been at that time, only then later surpassed by the, the missions or the, the, the journeys to the North Pole. Also, the Nansen bottle. You ever heard of a Nansen bottle in, in marine biology? He developed a lot of the equipment of oceanography. Nansen uh, invites Birknes to come and join him at the what's called Bergen Museum. Uh, it becomes Bergen University and they have already a good reputation for uh, oceanographic research and he said I could use some meteorologists and I could use some theoretical physicists to help us understand what's going on in the water and how the water and the air are working. So they set up shop at Bergen and what happens at Bergen over the years that follow still to this day influences meteorology and it, it's, it's I think impossible to overstate the impact that this small group of people there had on the development of meteorology to this very day. Um, by the way, Nansen was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, not for his scientific work, it was a Nobel Peace Prize. He should have gotten it for his scientific work as well, but it was a Peace Prize because he brought many displaced scientists to Norway to escape the slaughter of World War I. So this is called the Norwegian cyclone model, mid-latitude cyclone, wave cyclone, they call it a lot of things. But these are some of the drawings, some of the earliest drawings of it. What happens is during the war, all of the high quality weather data that, had been that they had been receiving from the United States is cut off. Most of the data has been cut off from the rest of Europe. And so uh, the elder Bjergne sets up an extensive network of weather observation stations across Scandinavia primarily and around the North Sea. Um, and they begin to really on a, on a much tighter scale look at interactions and movements in the atmosphere. They're also using uh, balloon data extensively for the first time, looking at what's happening now three-dimensionally. And so out of this uh, work, uh, uh, Jack, the son, really further refines his ideas 
about how air masses interact and he realizes that they're not just interacting and they're not just interacting around fronts but the fronts are also being caught up in these great swirls these cyclones and anticyclones and that the entire thing is doing this crazy dance. So if you imagine if you're dancing with a partner and you're dancing across the room, you're doing uh, two or three things at once, right? You're turning around. You may even be changing your relationship physically with your partner and you're going across to the ballroom floor. And what they realized is the atmosphere was doing a complicated dance. There were things happening in three dimensions and across the fourth dimension of time and they were for the first time starting to get a feel for this. And they realized that this cyclone went through an evolution, went through a pattern of, of changes. And if you can understand that pattern, that gives you predictive capability. The publication of this, it, it was finished, the work was finished essentially uh, by the winter of 1919. 1920. This is what makes the centennial year right now. Uh, th this was when this first wave cyclone model was, was published. Now it underwent, as scientific work often does, refinements and changes and it's still, uh, there's still aspects of it being refined. By 1922, the work had evolved to include the so-called polar front idea as well, that these outbreaks occur along um, a more or less continuous boundary between colder air to the north, warmer air to the south, and the polar front model and the wave cyclone model starts to give predictive capability. This diagram on the left is actually the, the front piece. It's the front page of the publication. And if you've looked in the textbooks that you're using, Brian's, it's still in Darbuk and Lutgen's, the same basic diagram is in there. There's the, the, the cold sector and the warm sector, the occlusion here, uh, the relationship of the, of the fronts. They, they, had, they had pretty much nailed it by that time. But there was one little piece that was still being worked out and that actually has to do with what's going on up here. How many of you have some familiarity with this? Some of you in earth science or meteorology. I know some of you that have come over from the university. So it's the, it's the classic model of the cold sector, the warm sector, the cool sector the warm front, the cold front, and the, the occluded front, which we're going to introduce in just a second. Tor Bergeron. Who's heard of Tor Bergeron? Mm -hmm. Bergeron is a student of the Erkneys and a co-worker of the Sun at the Bergen School. Bergeron is very interested in what's going on with this idea. In fact, he's the guy that further refines it. He's the guy that gives you the symbols that you see on the map to this day. So the symbols that you see for warm front, cold front, occluded front, stationary front, that's Bergeron's work. He also comes up with a classification scheme for air masses. That's his work. It took a while for it to be universally accepted, but he's the first guy that puts it to the work that was being done by the originators of, of, this, of this work, of this uh, uh, cyclonic and polar front weather model. But there's something interesting. He starts to look at three-dimensional uh, analysis of this and he, he realizes something kind of funny is happening as the two fronts come together. When the cold front catches the warm front, the cold air is denser. It cuts under the warm air. It lifts the warm air off of the ground and now the warm front isn't touching the ground anymore so it can't really be a warm front. It is up in the air and it's not really a cold front. It's an occluded front. It's where the the, the two are zipping up is what I always referred to it as when I was teaching this. And as this warm air is carried up, that area of the occlusion has all kinds of crazy weather. How many of you have ever lived up in, say, you know, Pennsylvania or New Jersey or Delaware, Washington, D.C., up in that area of the country, where in the span of about an hour it can go from rain to sleet to snow back to rain again. The idea of how precipitation forms 
as hard as this may be for you to believe, we didn't have a good handle on what makes most of the rain fall until well into the 20th century. And Bergeron gets very interested in not just what makes precipitation, but how all these different kinds of precipitation fall in the occlusion. So he starts to look into that. Well, some of you might recognize this fellow because he was the subject of a previous uh, lecture I gave to this group. The last time I gave a joint lecture, I believe, for AMS and Science Seminar Series. It's Alfred Wegener. We know him from Continental Drift, right? Well, I, I said then Alfred Wegener would have a footnote in the history of science had he never said a word about continental drift for having made a discovery that led to this idea of how most of the rain on the planet originates. It has to do with the difference in saturation vapor pressure between ice crystals and water droplets. Now that gets kind of deep kind of quick, but I'll just say this. They aren't the same. And that has everything to do with how most of the rain is generated. So what we now understand is that if you can have ice crystals in the presence of water droplets, the ice crystals will grow rapidly. They'll become a snowflake. And they'll get big enough that they may fall. And as they fall, well, there's several things that could happen. They could arrive at the surface still a crystal, that's snow. They could arrive at the surface having melted, and that's rain. They could, on the way down, melt, and then refreeze. What's that? Sleet, not hail. That's the sucker answer. I always put that one on the multiple. You do too, I, right? Yes, that's like D, hail. Come back to that in a minute. They might fall, melt, become super cooled, but not frozen, and then freeze on impact. And what's that? that that's time to call your insurance company, because when it hits the ground and you're driving, it's going to cause black ice and you're going to be out of control. Anybody ever driven where you're having freezing rain? Tell you what else that freezing rain will do. Those droplets that are super cooled, either while they're falling or the smaller ones while they're still suspended, when they strike the front edge of an aircraft's wing or the leading edge of propellers in flight spells disaster if you don't have de-icing equipment on the plane. That's the icing that's worrisome to pilots. Bergeron, we usually call this a Bergeron process, but the full name of it is the wegener bergeron Dyson process. And it explains how the rain falls. Another one of the Bergen meteorologists has now delivered a fundamental piece of knowledge about our atmosphere and our planet. So there's Tor Berger on there. Ever heard of Carl Rosby? Rosby is the first meteorologist ever to have his picture on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, but that's not, you know, that, that was a result of not the reason for his fame, right? Uh, Carl Rosby uh, did a lot of work with high altitude wind circulation and patterns. Again, where does he come from? Well, he's a member of that Bergen group, studies geophysics under Vierknes. And he gets a fellowship to go to America to study how the polar front theory can be applied to the American storms. He likes America, he stays, becomes an American citizen, becomes involved in research and becomes the uh, assistant director of research at the Weather Bureau, as it was called at that time. Um, and then on to the University of Chicago of Chicago. <clears throat> His work with understanding the upper atmosphere gave us finally a good understanding of the jet stream circulation and the, the pattern of long wave, planetary scale waves that bear his name, Rossby waves. And in an interesting way, that comes back around to the work that the others have been doing. Because what causes cyclogenesis in so many situations has to do with what's happening in the upper atmosphere. And that was one of the missing pieces because they didn't have access to it until they had higher flying aircraft and radio sons that wasn't fully understood. Once we got a better understanding of how the troughs and ridges 
in upper level circulation work how the short waves can ride on those long waves, then things start to really come into focus. We start to much more accurately be able to predict where these storms will break out, which way they'll track, how severe they'll be. So he adds really, you can literally say, another dimension to this understanding. Jet streams were also important in terms of some research that was being done around the time he was doing this work. We were fighting another world war. And the aircraft in that world war could fly higher and faster than the aircraft in the first world war. And one of the things that they were finding is, particularly in the Pacific, they were running into some unbelievable headwinds. The big B-29 bombers that were attacking the Japanese main islands oftentimes would have to turn back and abort their attack because the headwinds were so strong they would burn too much fuel to be able to make it back safely. When they would turn back, now instead of bucking a 150 knot headwind, now they're getting kicked in the rear end by it and they're back over their base in no time the pilots started to realize there's something going on because other missions a few hundred miles one way or another weren't encountering it. It seemed like there were these rivers of air, high speed rivers of air in the atmosphere. And there were. These are the jet, the, the jet streams. Ironically, discovered by propeller planes, not by jets. So, There's the Rossby waves. Can you see them? What we find is that these waves will set up in any kind of a hydrodynamic situation that uh, works for them. And so we even find them on the sun in the circulation of the uh, gases that make up the sun. Now, <clears throat> World War II comes along and again is a major disruptor. And when World War II comes along, of course, one of the things that turns the tide in the war is the D-Day invasion. And planning for that invasion, um, a lot of things had to go into it. The tides had to be right, the weather had to be right, the moon phase had to be right, not just because of the tides, but also to provide the cover of darkness. Everything had to line up. Well, we didn't, we weren't the only ones that knew what had to line up, the Germans did too. So they knew there were certain windows when the attack would be likely to come each month. And in May of 1944, they were prepared and the attack didn't come. So the next opportunity would be in June. But in June, the weather was looking really bad. In fact, really, really bad. So bad, the Germans actually said, yeah, nah, they're not gonna attack. They couldn't attack. Not only was the weather bad, but remember, we were also faking them out as to where we were going to go. They thought we were going to Calais, went to Normandy. But they thought, no, no, that ain't going to happen. Well, what they didn't realize is that the Bergen School of Meteorology was on this job. Sphere Peterson, and I have his book. How many of you have the silver? You have the silver book? You probably got a later edition, right? We had the silver book, right? <laughs> He was uh, working with the Allies Weather Planning Office along with others who were trained from the Bergen School of Meteorology on developing the latest <coughs> forecast to see if there would be a break in the weather. They had the best information they could get from measurements made across land and sea. Also, the Germans had no way to know this, but the Germans were giving them good information. They were feeding into their predictions. We'd cracked the code and were able to decipher the U-boat transmissions. And every day, in a very German way, at a very precise time, the U-boat commanders gave a weather report. And there were a bunch of U-boats out there, and it gave them a network of weather out over the ocean, which is always a blind spot even today for us not until satellites, and even incomplete now with satellites, is our coverage of the ocean. So we had a pretty good idea what was going on. There was a big disagreement. Some of the meteorologists believed the weather would not break, 
And these guys said, oh, it ain't going to be a great day for an invasion, but it's going to be a good enough day for an invasion. And that helped get the drop on the Germans. The weather broke enough that they were able to launch the attack. And while there were some casualties that were no doubt the result of the high seas and the winds, it was far fewer than would have been the case if the Germans would have been ready. The element of surprise helped save many, many thousands of lives more than those lost. Now, in 1939, Jack Birknace brought his family to America to give a lecture tour in the United States. It was supposed to be an eight-month tour, but the war broke out, and in April, Germany invaded Norway. Uh, and their, their visit became a permanent one. They knew they would never go home again. Uh, the Air Force, in those days prior to 1947, the Army Air Force, uh, sought his service and asked if he would take over the training of meteorological officers at, at their uh, uh, weather school that was set up in California at the University uh, of California. Los Angeles. And so he began to train um, military meteorologists in World War II to make more accurate forecasts and continued his own research, particularly in the area of aviation weather forecasting. He made a number of uh, further discoveries that were useful in that area, which certainly benefited during the war era, but after the war is one of the things that then began a safe era of commercial air. Uh, uh, transport. When the war was over, he continued his research. He, in fact, continued his research until the time of his death in 1975. But he had one more big discovery to make, and everybody in here has heard of it. Who has not heard of El Nino? Right? More more accurately, Enso, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Yep, you knew it, didn't you? You knew it well, about it, but did you know it was another one of those Bergen guys? Well, it was the old man's son. It was Jack Bjerknes who made the discovery of this uh, uh, phenomenon. And um, that was his last major discovery. It was made in a number of papers published between about 1966 and uh, <clears throat> maybe 68 or so. Ironically, around the same time as Wegener's idea had been resurrected and was being reintroduced as plate tectonics. So I leave you with this thought. <clears throat> kind of ironic because he's got an umbrella. Never discount what a small group of individuals led by the right mentor can accomplish. That Bergen School has cast a long shadow on meteorology. We often think that the big discoveries only come at the big schools or the big research institutes. The big discoveries aren't brought about by that building or even that foundation or endowment that they might have, although money helps. It has to do with the people that are there. It has to do with their dedication. It has to do with the people that they bring together and what kind of ideas that they exchange. And in fact, there's some argument to be made that smaller teams working very synergistically and not competitively may be the optimum model for really generating these kinds of groundbreaking ideas. Um, now, I've got a question for you before you go. Well, look at that. I haven't lost my touch. See, you know, after all the years, you know how to time it out. Because if you don't, this is what you hear. <laughs> You're the only one has been doing it longer than me, Dale. So, how many of you before this afternoon ever heard of Wilhelm Bierknes or his son Jack? So for the non-meteorologist in the room, this was something new. You all have seen these satellite pictures, but now you're going to see them a different way because you're not going to be able to see them again without knowing the story about who it is that gave us the understanding about how the weather is in motion. So I appreciate your attention. Make sure you get signed in if you're looking to get credit.